you always, not you representing always, no, very well for you me. Put Stop this back, representing you for put me. It, well, then you call them, Cody, because you always oh, put it back on me. I, that phone goes you, both ways, you and I've been available to me. talk. You no, know, it still surprises me that Cody feels like it's my responsibility to facilitate this relationship between he and my children. I, I was not, only asking everybody I, to obey the rules of our home. You have cheated me out of my contact with my family. And there's no longer this need to separate for fear of the disease. I mean, that's what I felt like. I mean, you... You're like, my boys have to apologize to Robin. Garrison called her up. Okay, I know, listen, no, I'm... There's a reason for that. Yeah, but... Calls her up and accuses her of the one... Do That's like really weird to transmute that much stuff onto somebody that was only being compliant with what I was saying we needed to do in order to protect our family. So a few days after the confrontation, we got a text message from McKelty saying that Robin and her kids weren't going to participate in this year's gift exchange. And it kind of hurt. All of you are just kind of jerks. I don't want to be around you. And I'm tired of it. And I don't want to call them. And I don't want to talk to them. That this is us going, you know what, Robin? Have it. Because we don't care anymore. We're all grown adults that don't need a father figure anymore. Hello friends, it's Katie from Without a Crystal Ball. Welcome back to my channel. It is Wednesday, September 11th, 2024. Janelle Brown is speaking for the first time in a exclusive interview with People Magazine about the devastating loss of her son, Garrison. Garrison Brown's life was tragically cut short in March of 2024. Janelle is speaking for the first time in an interview and sharing what she knew and didn't know in the months leading up to what occurred. The title of the article is Janelle Brown had no idea Garrison was struggling before his passing, never expected this. The quote, he didn't ever express any kind of extreme sad feelings. In fact, he was very funny, very upbeat. He had a career path that he was very excited about. This interview is going to be very, very heartbreaking for so many of you. And it will also indicate and show to you just how much the family didn't know, but also what she did know and reading in between the lines of what she says. She's a grieving mother and obviously doesn't need to share all of the details about what happened, but this is what she said. She said, we had no idea that he was in that place. Adding that substance abuse likely played a role in his state of mind before his passing but he didn't ever express any kinds of extreme sad feelings. In fact, he was very funny, very upbeat. He had a career path that he was excited about. He had a life. He had friends. Janelle said that she and her family members had never had any idea that it would go this way, noting that there weren't any obvious warning signs and that Garrison frequently spoke to family. Towards the end of the, his life, she says her son checked in with his loved ones, had adopted another cat, and felt really excited about his career prospects. She said, we actually were having conversations. He had all the resources that he could have needed. This was just such a shock. We just never expected this. I really actually had sort of thought like, okay, maybe he's finally starting to get his momentum. It's hard in your 20s to find your path. And I was really excited, so it was such a shock because there was just no indication at all. Janelle is obviously grieving, obviously grieving. And I don't expect her to reveal all the details about what happened that night. And I'm also assuming there are constraints on what she can say due to her contract with TLC. But according to the text messages and what she told the police, she did know that Garrison was struggling, and I hope that um, Janelle knows that it is okay to acknowledge that, and it is not a failure as a mother that she knew, and it still happened. It doesn't mean it's her fault, and I hope she knows that we know that she tried. She did reach out to him that night. She was worried about him that night. She was very concerned, and he acknowledged to her in his final text that he struggled with thoughts of ending his life. 
and he assured her that he didn't have any anything in his house that would that could lead to him taking his life. So he was definitely not in a good place that evening. And she definitely knew he was struggling. She may have not understood the gravity of the situation at the time. Janelle also noted that she believes that a lot of young men his age suffer from mental health issues that never get addressed. She said, we should be speaking more, especially about mental health for men, and that there's no shame in getting help and seeking help. We just had no idea this was such a shock to us. Janelle did, again, know what was going on. I think, again, she's trying to protect herself, and I'm sure this is so hard for her. I know that in time, she'll probably stop blaming herself, and it's not her fault. I just hope she knows it's not her fault. All of them knew that he was struggling. She talked about it on the show. I don't believe that any loved one of anyone that ends their life that believes that this is going to be the outcome. I think we all think that we can prevent it. And that's just unfortunately not true. Now Janelle says that her family members do real check-ins whenever they connect. She says, we are very real and we assess. Life situations come up and we're always like, okay, so what about mental health? We actually say the words and we wait to hear what's really happening, not just kind of gloss over it. I think we're definitely putting more stock in mental health in our family. Janelle acknowledges there wasn't much more she could have done as a mother to prevent the tragedy. She stated, I don't know that we could, what we could have done differently. We were definitely, and I would encourage everyone to be that way, we were having real conversations with him, we were offering resources, and we were always talking to him, and we were loving him. All the things were there. It really just was something that he could not, like the demon, he couldn't get on top of the battle. He couldn't seem to get over. It just wasn't for a lack of love or lack of anything. And all I can do is think, we always ask ourselves, could we have done something more? But I don't know. I think that's a grief trap because I think ultimately everyone is responsible for their own actions and their own decisions. But we did everything. We really did everything that we could have done. And unfortunately, sometimes that still isn't enough. I think in this specific portion, what is she speaking about and the demon that she is referring to is alcohol and that this was a demon that he couldn't get over. In their belief system and a lot of fundamentalist faiths, addiction is looked at as something that is a weakness in someone and it's not viewed as an illness and it's not viewed as something that someone can't control. Now, it's good that she's talking about offering him resources, like options to help him get help for the, the drinking, but it sounds like what she's saying is he couldn't overcome that, and she's acknowledging that the alcohol contributed to what happened that night. With any substance use disorder, and that includes alcohol, it is a progressive disease, and once you get to a stage where you are an active, dependent user of it, and you it controls your life, you no longer have control of your use of it. And the only way to get over, quote unquote, getting over what the illness is, is by getting professional help. Unfortunately, due to the culture that they are part of, the cult that they're in, there is so much ignorance around substance use disorders along with mental illness. And unfortunately, there's a great stigma on it with many in this culture believing that both mental illness and substance use disorders are a weakness of someone, maybe Satan taking a hold of something in their life. And unfortunately, it's hard for people to get help when they've been indoctrinated to believe that something is wrong with them. And it's their fault that they've done this. It might make it harder for someone to reach out for help if they feel like they failed. And I just want to remind anyone that if you are in this community, if you're from the Apostolic United Brethren, if you're fun from the world of fundamentalist polygamy, and if you're struggling with substance use disorder, it is not your fault. It is not anything you can control. If you're struggling with depression or thoughts of harming yourself, that is, again, not your fault. That is an illness. And it's okay to reach out for help. And it's okay to tell yourself that just because this is happening, it's not a sign of the world and your wicked choices 
or that Satan has gotten into your body or that you are not strong enough. You are strong enough, but illnesses we cannot control. Moderation is not spoken about in this culture because they abstain from alcohol. And so even discussing mental illness and substance use disorder is incredibly taboo for Janelle. I commend her for being open about the fact that Garrison was struggling with alcohol dependency. It's clear based upon his toxicology that he was using a lot. I think his blood alcohol level was 0.374 at the time of his passing. And his roommates stated that he had been struggling with alcoholism and that he actively was drinking nearly every night. And that sometimes he would stumble and he was struggling with his shame about drinking, obviously because in their culture, drinking is a sin. Garrison not only was a fundamentalist Mormon, but he did at one point in time convert to the LDS mainstream church. Within the LDS mainstream church, it is also a sin to drink alcohol. There is so much shame for people when they're in a culture of extreme abstinence like this, that when they do start drinking, they feel like they have not only failed themselves, but they are weak, but also that they have failed God and allowed Satan into their lives. My heart goes out to the family having to go through all of this so publicly. And again, I commend Janelle for taking the step forward. She clearly might not be ready to speak about everything that Garrison was going through and all of the struggles that he was facing. But she is acknowledging that he was struggling. He They provided resources and she doesn't know what she would have done differently. After, after I read this article, I reached out to someone from the Apostolic United Brethren, a former member, and I asked them specifically because this person has a unique perspective, not only as someone that grew up in this culture who is a family member of Christine Brown's, but also because once they left this culture, they went on to get their master's degree and now work as a licensed therapist. In their work, they specifically help people that are dealing with substance use disorder. And so they were able to provide to me a perspective that I think might offer to you an understanding of the belief system along with the struggles of individuals dealing with these challenges. They said, there is so much heartbreak in her statements. I can believe she didn't see it. She wanted to believe everything was okay. She was checking in. She was reaching out. She blames alcohol as the demon he couldn't escape. But when I work in counseling with addicts, one of my first questions is, what is going on in your life that is so awful that you need to escape? In Garrison's life, he was always escaping the pain of his father's rejection, a hole that couldn't be filled, the feelings of hopelessness he was experiencing. He tried to fill it with purpose, his career, the brotherhood of the military, a new cat, but alcohol is a depressant and help to push the hopelessness over the edge. It is so painful and so sad. So I want to thank this former member for providing me that context because it's very challenging for anyone in the Apostolic United Brethren to address topics like people ending their lives or substance use disorder because both of these are sins in the church. And so many of the people in the church believe that both of these are wicked and evil. And often and too often, families that deal with these issues brush it under the rug because they're told that they need to, you know, keep a positive face for polygamy, to always show the bright side of polygamy. They don't want to show the darker, more tragic issues that happen within their culture. And I hope that in all of this, if the family is now beginning to open up and talk more about mental health issues, that it will open a door for others in the family to consider getting their own help if they're struggling and not relying on naturopathic remedies to manage their mental illness. I know that Christine and others in the family really look to naturopathic remedies to manage mental illness. 
And I understand that this is ingrained in their system. And there is fear around pharmaceutical drugs because of the culture that they're in. I know that Christine went on medication when she was postpartum and it helped her tremendously. So I do know there's a window that there's an openness in the family to go that route. And I just know that if anyone in the family is watching, and I don't know if they do, I know I'm not their favorite, that if you are struggling, it's okay to speak to your doctor. Pharmaceutical medications are not evil. If you do have a chemical imbalance, they can help you get to a point in your life where things can become more manageable, your symptoms improve, and you can get back to what it is that you care about. And I also hope that they know that there's always therapy available and that trauma therapists can help them deconstruct. There's resources through organizations like Hope After Polygamy and Holding Out Help that can help with counseling if you don't know where to go. And this is a very heartbreaking reality in the world of polygamy that happens too frequently into individuals that leave this culture and specifically to the young men of the culture. Young men are cast out and rejected by their fathers because they become competition for women. And those men that don't comply and don't conform are shunned. And that rejection can be very painful for anyone to manage. I truly hope that in time, Cody Brown can acknowledge the damage and the pain that he has caused to the children in his life that he has abandoned. I don't have a lot of hope that he will, but I hope that the kids know that they don't have to be in pain. They can get help if they're struggling and there's so much help out there and it's not your fault. You are not wrong for feeling sad about what your father has done. Don't make your father believe that your disobedience is worse than the worst thing in the world. Don't let your father's actions and words about you penetrate your souls because you are survivors of a polygamous cult and you are survivors of reality television. And there are so many of you that have such powerful positions in life because of this show that you can use this for good. All right, everyone, let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. If you or anyone you know is struggling, make sure that you contact 988 at any time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if you're struggling with thoughts of ending your life. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up. Make sure to subscribe to my channel if you haven't subscribed and please click the bell so you never miss a video. Thank you so much for watching. Bye everyone.